What is up, everybody? This is Julian Powers. You might better know me as JP. And this is the Exercise Science Podcast, where I go over anything related to the exercise sciences, whether that be a topic that you guys want or a topic that I feel that needs to be talked about. Um, first things first, please go check out my Patreon, and that's patreon.com forward slash JP Fitness. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash JP Fitness. Patreon is a way that uh, fans of creators, so it could be anything, but in this case, it'd be fitness content. Um, fans of the creators can support the creator um, through like uh, money or donations but they it's not just for nothing it's you guys get rewards in return and i have six different tiers based on how much you want to pledge and again it could be anything from monthly workouts to online coaching or i'll go over a study and that and tell you how that study can help you in your exercise programs and routines so definitely check that out i got a lot of good content on there again that's patreon.com forward slash jp fitness all right today's episode in the exercise science podcast is episode number four and that's going to be about seven fitness myths that um, I feel like I hear a lot and that aren't true. Um, I'm going to talk about them and tell you why they aren't true and maybe how they got around. But again, if you're in the uh, exercise fitness industry, whatever you want to call it, or even in the health industry of any kind, it seems to me like obviously people like to talk, people like to spread rumors, but this industry especially has a lot of myths that go around. Bro science, if that's how how you want to call it. Um, all of that, it just tends to spread. Someone says something to someone else and it has a big fancy word in it like, oh, they say this is physiological and this is how it happens. And someone hears that big word and they think, oh, because it sounds right that it's automatically correct. Um, f- the thing with exercise and fitness, it could be very uh, it could be very nitpicky in a sense or you have to be nitpicky with it because there could be very tiny things that someone can talk about that they, that there might not even be studies on. So a lot of the times where people might have an answer for something, they're wrong. Or sometimes a lot of the people that might have an answer for something, they they might not know the answer. There might not be an answer that has been found yet in the you know in the literature. So um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about seven myths that you know that I hear that are pretty common or that you might have heard too. Um, some of these myths might be pretty uh, similar, but I'm gonna try to not keep them similar, and I'm not gonna try to talk about more common ones like. For example, ones about spot reduction. Um, there, that's pretty common, and people usually know even as bad as myths can get. People usually know that spot reduction is not true, and that you can't get rid of fat around, like let's just say your abs by doing crunches. That you have to, you know, uh, decrease your caloric intake. Now, I'm not saying that everyone knows this, and some people do believe in spot reduction still, but that's so uncommon that I'm not going to talk about very common ones. All right, we'll jump right into number one, and this one really bugs me because I hear it all the time. It's if they if a person doesn't go to full range of motion, it doesn't count. Um, this really pisses me off because I I hear it. I've just watched a video a few weeks ago on this. Um, I hear it all the time, and people like to think that if you don't go full range of motion on exercise, that one it doesn't count, and two you get no benefits from not from not going full range of motion. When both of these are wrong, one I don't care if you like okay I don't care if you want unrack a squat bar and you go down six inches obviously that's not going to get you the the best results you can but even if you go down six inches on a squat which is barely anything you're still going to see results from doing that there's still some work being done work is force times the displacement so you can't say that there's not nothing being done now this is an exaggeration typically when people say when they talk crap or talk shit on people um not going full range of motion how it usually is is Someone puts a lot more weight on the, the bar than they're supposed to, and then they do a quarter squat, and then they think that, oh, that's what that they can squat. Of course, that's not what they, they can squat. Personally, for people who are looking down on this, we all know that maybe that's not uh, that's not truly what they can squat by any type of other measurements, whether that be powerlifting standards, whether that be if you think it doesn't count if you don't go ass to grass. That's an obvious one, okay? That's obviously wrong. I'm not talking about obvious things like that. What I have a problem is with like, like like the other extremes like for example you may have heard if it, if you don't go ass to grass on a squat or if the bar doesn't touch your chest on a bench or or any number of other what uh, other range of motion limiters that people like to throw on exercises that it doesn't count well, we'll just take those two examples one unless you're going to be powerlifting if you're not going to be a professional powerlifter then you do not have to touch your chest with the bar on a bench press for some people this can if they've had shoulder injuries in the past or they're just not biomechanically uh, able or like let's just say they're not biomechanically sound to do a full range of motion bench press 
then they shouldn't have to do that or it's not even wise to do that because sometimes injuries don't happen with one big blunt force they happen with repetitive micro micro trauma they happen from doing something over and over and over let's just say you take someone with really long arms and a really skinny chest for example so that when they move the bar through the range full range of motion let's just say it's a large range of motion and then that when they go all the way down they take the bar all the way down to their chest on a bench press that their arm is a uh, horizontally abducted to an extreme uh, degree and again that might not be a very sound position for your shoulders your shoulders might be compromised in that position so from someone who has those type of biomechanics that might, going down on a bench press isn't uh might not be the best way to do something because due to performance and increase of injury again i'm not talking about powerlifters either if you're a powerlifter you have a defined what you have to do rules and at a mean you have to touch your chest if you can't do that and it jacks up your shoulders then you either can't be a powerlifter you're gonna have to find some other way to get around that but i'm not talking about that sense and i'm also not making excuses for people who only go down a little bit like the quarter squat example most people can hit a, a somewhat respectable range of motion so that's obvious i'm not talking about the obvious for example them what if someone stops three inches above their chest and then someone wants to be nitpicky about it and say oh man you didn't touch your chest it doesn't count well one some people like i said that can hurt that hurts them or it could hurt them in the future too it just maybe not might not increase performance what if they go down that low and it's just awkward and it's gimmicky and it doesn't feel weird now that's not everybody some people can go down on a bench press and touch their chest and this same thing and this is with the squat too this really happens with the squat a lot of people try to say oh if you don't go ass to grass it doesn't count okay you, that is probably one of the most ignorant things uh that i i've heard that uh, on this list one of the most ignorant ignorant myths that i've heard and i ignorant because someone doesn't clearly you don't understand biomechanics or you don't understand differences in anatomy to be saying something like that because what if someone has really long femurs and they have a really short torso and they they're just not built to squat deep like that and then that when they do squat deep they get such a massive a posterior pelvic tilt or butt wink whatever you want to call it that their low back just gets on fire or hurts it's in pain and they start having pain like spine pain and it they're it just they're sore and it just doesn't it's not good so not everyone can go ass to grass so saying that oh you have to go ass to grass or it doesn't count on either a squat or go all the way down and touch your chest on a bench press clearly you don't understand biomechanics and you don't understand that everyone's different and people do exercises differently again if you're a power lifter it's a little bit different the crease of the hips has to go at or below the knee i think it's at or below the knee or it's just below the knee but either way you got to go i think it's a little bit below parallel as a power lifter so you have clear rules and standards that you got to do but and again i'm not making excuses for the squatter who can squat to parallel and only does quarter squats um because again that's just someone wanting to ego lift and i'm not i'm not promoting or trying to back up ego lifting no to ego lifting but i'm also not trying to promote i guess ego down talking this is i guess it's the opposite it's people down feeling like they're they have a big enough ego to be like oh man you ain't going ass to grass like me you know i'm squatting all the way down like i think that's bullshit you're full of shit and it's you obviously don't know what you're talking about and this doesn't just go with limiting range of motion there like i've seen videos on youtube um where people try to say that uh doing 21s if you don't know what 21s are 21 repetition style is seven reps the top range of motion just the top so you're cutting your range of motion in half seven reps the next seven reps is the bottom range of motion which is then 14 reps total and then you do seven reps full range of motion so for example on a squat you do seven reps the top quarter of the squat you do seven reps the top the bottom quarter and then you do seven full reps whatever full rep that is for you now i've seen people on youtube say that you shouldn't do that that's false sometimes a manipulating range of motion in that sort of way can make it harder on different aspects of that range of motion um for example if you just for example if you just stick to doing the full range of motion in that exact same motor pattern you can't really overload any of those uh ranges ranges of motion at any point in time or for example on a uh, uh, bench press let's just say you're always touching your 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 chest with the bar um and this is going to kind of lead into another point but we'll talk about it in, uh, later on uh but if you're always touching your your chest with the bar, you can kind of innately be using the stretch shortening cycle a little bit to help you get those reps. So if you limit your range of motion a little bit, you can kind of kill the stretch shortening cycle to make it a little bit harder on you in the long run. And 
basically you're just getting a new stimulus and you're making it harder on different parts of the range of motion. Now I'm not saying you should do this all the time, but this, this is a tool, something that you can use to benefit your full range of motion squat. So saying that, oh, you have to go full range of motion or it's wasting the reps. You're an idiot. You don't understand what you're talking about. So um, clearly you don't. And again, if you're just mistaken, that's okay. But I mean, some of these people that I see, they're so, uh, they're so uh, for it. They're so if you're not doing full range of motion, you're the one who's done. Well, it's just, it's maddening because you're stupid and you clearly don't understand uh, physics when it comes to lifting, which, or biomechanics, uh, however you want to talk about it, but you clearly don't understand that. Um, we're going to go into now the next myth, uh, bro science myth, fitness myth, um, and that is you have to train to failure to see results. And now this is going to be a little bit controversial for someone listening to this. You've probably heard, and there are some good channels that I've seen say this, that you have to train to failure. Um, you don't um, just to see results. Now, there are some circumstances that training to failure could get you the same results. And a lot of the times training to failure does get you the same results as not training to failure. But you don't have to train to failure to uh to see results or to make the the most gains, you don't gain anything better from training to failure. Um, now, for people who don't underst uh, understand what RPE is, a rating of perceived exertion, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. If you do, um, just uh, you can, I guess, ignore this part. But for people who don't, rating of perceived exertion is base is uh, it's on a one through ten scale, and uh, it's it's a scale determining how many reps you have left in that set or how hard that set is. However, you want to take it. So, for example, a 10 on the RPE scale would be you had no reps left and you trained either to failure or you trained to the point where you knew that you, for an absolute certainty, that you would not be able to get another rep. A 9 RPE would be like you knew you had one rep left. An 8 RPE would be like you had two reps left. A 7 RPE would mean you have like three, four reps left. So you get the picture. A 1 RPE would mean the set was really easy and you stopped after doing one rep and you felt like you had a bunch of more reps left in you. So it's just a scale of RPE. So using this scale, I'm going to talk, use the scale from uh, for the rest of the, this point. But training to a 10 RPE has no benefit over training to like a 7 or an 8 RPE in, in nearly every single aspect. Now, just again, try not to be closed minded with this. I know, and I'm not, and I'm not going to name any channels, but I've named, I know a lot of good channels and channels that put out mostly good content that have said that, oh, they believe it's good to train to failure or they think that you should train to failure. Nowhere in the literature does it show that training to failure um, promotes more muscle growth or greater strength responses than does training training not to failure does um again i'm not i'm not going to post all the studies for this stuff again i have all my social media linked at patreon.com forward slash jp fitness you can go there you can go to, click on my facebook link on that page and message me on facebook and i'll link you the study myself i'm not trying to hide it i just don't want to post a billion studies on here i might even post this one though because i think it's, it's interesting but there was a study done where they showed the way they took two groups obviously one group that trained to failure and one group that did not train to failure but they equated volume people have to i think they i think they equated volume people have to put that in their heads is that they equated equated volume so volume was the same and one group trained to failure and one group did it there was no differences in gains in strength or gains in a hypertrophy the group that trained to failure they did though show gains in muscular endurance which would make sense because they're pushing their body to the point where um uh, their their muscular system to the point where they want to kind of stop but they're saying oh you know we're going to keep going that would make a little bit more sense but when it comes to strength and hypertrophy they see no gains in strength or hypertrophy and on top of this they sh they see an increases in uh certain hormones as such as cortisol which is a stress hormone which all that does tell me is that you're putting in more effort but you're in per these sets, which, but you're not getting any more results, which leads me to believe that that's just going to increase the chances that one, you injure yourself during training or two, you reach overtraining, which is another point we're going to talk about in a little bit. So you don't necessarily need to train to fail. You don't need to train to fail. You have to think about this in, in, uh, terms of volume. Volume is how much work, like work you do over work at which mo typically people calculate volume as weight times reps times sets or just weight times all the reps that you do during the workout so for example and as any experienced lifter knows you will know this too trust me if you're not if just don't be closed-minded ask yourself this if you let's just say you're doing bench press and you go to a 10 rp you go until the last rep is a grinder like an absolute grinder till it was like you're barely able to get it up hopefully you have a spotter there with you or you have spotter bars on the sides but 
let's just say you take it all the way to you can test this out yourself um do a proper warm up i don't want you to hurt yourself but take this to the point where you lift and you lift to the till the last rep is super super hard then take whatever rest period that is two minutes and then do your next set and keep that same weight on and see how many reps you get with that weight the same weight after you did that grinder set two minutes later then another time what i want you to do is do the same thing except the first set don't go to failure don't stop maybe two to three reps shy of failure so it shouldn't be super hard two to three reps shy of failure it should be a little hard but it shouldn't be like a grinder in any sort of sense. It shouldn't be like you're grinding through the rep and you're irking it out to get above. Stop, take the same amount of rest, and then go back and then do the second set. And then say, see how many reps you get on that second set. Um, and then for that second set, though, I want you to, for, sec- for the second set of both days that you do this, I want you to uh, go to failure too. So the only difference is one day, I want you to take both sets to failure on the second day, I want you to take only the first set, uh, only the second set to failure. And then when you do this, it, multiply your weight times the total reps in both sets and see how much weight you get. I know this is just an anecdotal claim for you because it's just a claim for you. But typically, I guarantee you that in the day where you conserve your energy on the first set, you're going to be able to get more total reps with that same weight, which means more overall volume, which is the key marker to making gains in strength and making gains in hypertrophy. Taking... For the normal lifter, when they're taking every set to failure, they're going to have to, one, well, increasing rest times doesn't help. You're either going to have to increase rest rest time so dramatic to the point where it's just not going to make it practical to work out. Two, you're either going to have to lower the weight, which again is going to lower the volume, or three, you're going to have to not take the sets to failure, which is the best option. Like I said, the literature shows that training to failure is not optimal. Now, there are certain circumstances where I might say, then again, that training to failure, it's not better than training to not to failure, but there might be certain circumstances where you want to train to failure. One, you might want to train to failure if you have a shorter workout to make sure that you're getting the most out of every single set. Now, if you find that you're training to failure and you're hitting dramatically less volume on sets, you need to ask yourself, well, because some people, when you ask them training to failure, failure is a little bit different between people. If you're truly taking it to failure when you are stopping mid-rep and you can't get the rep, I wouldn't advocate doing that. But for some people, they stop when they think that the next rep is pretty hard or they're not going to be able to get it, which technically isn't failure. But what I, it's te- not technically failure. But anyways, I would train, if your workouts are pretty short and you don't work out super frequently, in that sense, you might want to train at or near failure just to make sure that you're getting the most out of your workouts. Because if you undervalue each set and you only have a few sets that you're doing because you don't have much time or you're busy and you don't want super long workouts, then you may not be getting the most out of your workouts. Or two, there was another study that I read that compared um, low load training took into failure versus uh, moderate or not moderately heavy or heavy load training not taken to failure um and then that the low load training taken to failure i think it was at 30 percent of one or at max made the same amount of strength gains in the group that was training moderately heavy to failure so if you're training with low loads um i would definitely recommend you take it to failure if if that's what your goal is to see hypertrophy or whatever it is um if you're training for a particular sport or something and you have to do it differently that's okay but if you're training for if you're training with low loads, which again, I don't know why you would anyways, that's not the most efficient way to uh, uh, make growth over the long, long run or have the most volume, I would train to failure. You might have, and this is uh, better put to people who have like certain segments of training to different uh, uh, training modalities. Like for example, if you have strength for one part, hypertrophy for one part, and then you're doing the wise thing and not training to failure on those, and then maybe at the end you have maybe a higher rep sets for some exercise like push-ups, that you could probably take to failure. Um, but I wouldn't, most of your sets I would not take to failure. Again, it's just a myth. There, To my uh, knowledge and from what I've read, there is no known study that shows if that when volume is equated, remember, if volume is not equated, that's cheating. Of course, a group that trains to failure and much more volume might it might show that they have better gains. But when volume is equated, training to failure does not improve any gains in strength or hypertrophy. And on top of that, training to failure most of the time equates to less volume in the gym. So if you want more volume, you don't need to train to an REPE of 10 on every single set. All right, the next myth is... Um, and this is kind of what I mentioned on the last one. And this one, again, it, it kind of irked me before, but there's still a lot of people who believe it due to, again, YouTube bullshit and uh, just myths going around. And that that they say that overtraining isn't real. 
overtraining is real. If you think that over, if you're the one of those people that said overtraining isn't real and you pass it around, you really need to reevaluate that. If you take someone who's never worked out, never, I mean, this is besides the, and again, I'll get back to that example, but this is besides the hundreds and even thousands of studies that have been done on overtraining. So I'm not even, I mean, it's hard to talk about that when there's so much out there. So if you refuse to uh, go find that out yourself and just do a little bit of uh, searching for those studies, um, then there, I can't get to you through studies. Maybe I could try to get to you through logic, which is what I'm going to try to do right now. Take someone who never worked out before, never. And let's just say they're healthy in the sense that they don't have any underlying drastic medical problems. Um, let's just say you take them and you have them do squats for eight hours straight, or let's just say they did an eight hour arm workout. You probably already know where that's come. That's from right, babe. But, uh, um, you know, let's just say they did an eight hour arm workout and they've never worked out before. Um, that's, they're not going to make I don't, I, it's hard to even like, talk about this because it's so obvious. I mean, this is just an exaggeration. I'll bring it to a more re- realistic uh, scenario in a little bit. But if you take someone who's never worked out, they did an eight-hour arm workout, they're not going to see any positive benefits from that. Not any more than what they would do from just doing a few sets. And on top of that, eventually, maybe even from that one single workout, if someone trained more than they are able to more than their work capacity allows them to over time that they're going to see drastic negative health consequences from uh from doing from working just working out too much over training and those things can be you know not being able to get enough sleep irritability depression um not having an appetite uh things like that you know a uh, loss of muscle mass increased weight gain and that would lead to that would be from like things like increased stress hormones so if you don't want to know those things and you want to make proper gains, you need to understand that overtraining is real and you need to understand that work capacity is a thing. Uh, your capacity to be able to handle uh, overall work, you need to increase that over time. That's not something that's unlimited. If you say that overtraining isn't real, you're autom- you're inherently saying that people have an, an unlimited work capacity, which is absolutely ridiculous. And no, don't give me that bullshit of, oh, it's undernutrition or it's uh, not enough sleep or not enough eating. You could take someone who has perfect sleep, no other stress. They eat as many calories surplus as they can, um, proper supplements, and there still is overtraining. There still is overtraining. A lot of the people on YouTube who say that there isn't overtraining because you see them doing ridiculously high volumes of work, they're, they're usually on gear, which is aka steroids. They're on some type of uh, anabolic hormone that they're taking in it, and it's it lets it allows them to do some some ridiculous amount of work, um, a ridiculous amount of volume, and then they th- they say, oh, that you know overtraining isn't real, which is bullshit. It is real, and again, if you can't take literature or the logic, then there's no being able to get through to you. All right, number four, and this isn't this isn't a, what is a common one that is heard. It's a little bit different. Number four, squatting to X depth, and X could be whatever depth is bad for your knees. And I don't say deep. Or I don't say over your toes, or I don't say to halfway. I've heard every single one. I've heard people say it's bad on your knees for squatting to parallel. You gotta go full range of motion for, and those are usually the advocates for full range of motion. Like, oh, full range of motion isn't bad. Full range of motion is good. Half range of motion is bad. It's like they're trying to take shots on the other side just to back up what they're saying, which is wrong. Um, and then there's people who say, oh, full uh, full depth squats are bad, and that's more kind of kind of clear the air that a lot of people know that that's not bad, but it's still out there. And then the other one, which is kind of still common too, is knees over your toes is bad for your squats. Now, let me get this straight: there are people with jacked up knees; their knees are just messed up from whatever it was in their past. In that sense, maybe there's a certain depth where it might hurt your knees, but for a healthy individual. If you have the biomechanics that allow you to, squatting full depth is not going to hurt your knees inherently in and of itself, in and of itself. Squatting to parallel is not going to hurt your knees in and of itself. And then squatting with your knees over your toes in and of itself is not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt your knees. Now, again, if you have other underlying issues with your knees, those things might hurt you, but it's not those things in and of itself. You, You might not have a problem with your knees until you go and do those things because they're just maybe... They're just something that you just never done before. Um, that might be irritating um, some underlying knee issue that you had. But studies have shown that 
that when you go, when you do squats and you do, um, for whatever your biomechanics allow, doing full depth squats and maybe your in your knees going over your toes. Um, remember not purposely, but just that's how people squat. Um, will increase the strength of the ligaments and uh, tissues in your knees. You know the muscle fibers in your knees and the ligaments, which again, which would help with the stretch shortening cycle and stuff like that. Have letting you have that elastic rebound out of the hole to be able to move more weight. But basically, your knees see positive adaptations, not just the muscle itself. The tendons and ligaments see positive adaptations to going full depth in squats. Um, so you don't need to worry about going to whatever depth or whatever it is. Now, if you have, I'm not saying that you're not going to have problems going to a certain depth. You might have problems going to a certain depth, but it's not the squat itself. It's a problem with you. It's a problem with you. And that's not bad. I have, I had an ACL a tear and a meniscus tear when I was in the Marine Corps and I, uh, I had a small fracture at the top of my tibia. I fell off an obstacle course. It sucked ass, but, um, I have a problem with my knees. And sometimes when I squat it, like it makes my knee feel a little weird, but I don't do it when it hurts. But I mean, sometimes it does when the next day or it's my left knee that had the injury, but my right knee sometimes or maybe it's because I'm compensating when I walk or when I do squats and I don't even really know it. So again, it's not necessarily your knees that are the problem. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily the squats that are a problem. It is your knees. It's usually something with you. Or, again, you have to take into account, too, if your knees are so far over your toes, for example, and your heels are coming six inches off the ground and you're, like, literally on your tippy toes, like sissy squats, that might be something that's bad for you. But just your tibia uh, shifting forward and your feet are flat on the ground, you have good, proper technique and mechanics when you're doing your squat. That in and of itself is not going to mess up your knees. If again, the bad four might, but that will not hurt your knees. All right, myth number five. And again, this one's fairly common, and I'll explain why. And this kind of tied into one of the points earlier. And and I guess it isn't really like a myth about training. It's just something that I hear all the time. And that's, oh, and it could be said in multiple different ways is, you're not stronger than me, or you're not bigger than me, so I'm not going to listen to you. Or this guy on YouTube, whoever the hell it might be, this guy X, he is bigger than you, and he's stronger than you, so I'm going to listen to him. Or this guy on YouTube, or this guy over here is stronger, or he's super strong, or he's stronger than me, or he's bigger than me, so he must know what he's talking about. Now, this is just fucking, this is bullshit, because using this exact scenario... I could take, let's just say, like, I'll, let's just say I met up with Brian Shaw, and I said, okay, Brian Shaw, and if you don't know who that is, he's the world's strongest man, he's won it multiple times, um, he's won, pretty sure, Arnold Strongman Classic multiple times, but, uh, um, Brian Shaw, let's just say I talked to him, and I said, okay, Brian Shaw, I want you to mess your form up on purpose on a light deadlift, and then tell people that it's a special technique that you've done, and that, in that you think it helps you even though it's a little bit different and it looks wrong it's it's beneficial in that you're big and strong and that you've used this technique to help you get there now someone who's using this exact myth that i just said he's strong he must know what he's talking about will use that logic and be like oh well he must know what he's talking about that actually evaluating the information i don't give a shit how strong you are or how cool you think you are or how big you are or like what how fast you are i'm not no one basically what the smith is saying is that you're blindly listening to what someone is saying without evaluating the information first i don't just because they're strong doesn't mean that they're not wrong a lot of these people that are strong or big look at bodybuilders they have coaches look at strong people they have coaches i'm not saying that they don't know what they're talking about i'm just saying they don't know they don't automatically know what they're talking about based off their accomplishments i guarantee you and again, I didn't use Brian Shaw because I think he's a bad person. I think, obviously, he's an excellent athlete. He's the world's strongest man. But I'm just saying that that we could do that. And I guarantee there would be a lot of people who wouldn't really evaluate the information. They'd say, well, he's world's strongest man. How you Like, for example, and this is typically how I see it. Someone who's uh, knowledgeable will say um, on YouTube something that they did to get strong. And whatever it is um then someone in the comments will say oh well you're wrong because of this 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 it and remember i'm not saying this this person who's saying the youtube guy is either right or wrong either i'm just saying that they'll make uh they'll make a rebuttal to whatever they said or they'll make a point against what they said saying oh you're wrong because of this then a bunch of uh people who like that youtube guy will flood that comment and then say well you're bullshit he's won this award or he's done this or that without actually evaluating the information guess what not everyone is right okay so i don't care what the person's done you shouldn't just blindly believe what they say 
you should actually take what they say, look at it, evaluate it, and then say, okay, all oh, that makes sense, you know, just because that they've done something doesn't automatically mean it's correct or okay, you know, and then, again, that happens all the time, and, again, I'm not necessarily saying that the person on YouTube who's talking, and it could be either one that's at fault, maybe someone who's, like, it just doesn't make any sense, I've seen, uh, I've seen people who, and heard people who have had good accomplishments toward their, towards their name say something wrong. They said something about, you know, lifting uh, this, lifting high reps is better for burning fat or it's a fat burner rep range or something. When they're, they look pretty jacked, but that's kind of bullshit information. So I'm not necessarily saying the person who says something off of experience is right or wrong. You have to say experience does teach you a lot. Someone who's, uh, someone who's got trophies under their name or has a bunch of accomplishments under their name they probably know not a lot about what they do obviously if they don't know at least a lot about what they what they're doing they wouldn't be where they are in the first place work ethic alone is not going to take you places work ethic plus you have to have some type of knowledge technique of what you're doing and whatever career field you're doing to take you places so that says something but that doesn't mean you automatically should just believe what they say so again for someone who says oh it doesn't matter someone smaller than you might know more about you than lifting someone weaker than you might know more about biomechanics than you do they might not might know more about levers leverage they might know more about technique than you do um their experience does say a lot trust me i'm not trying to devalue experience i'm not trying to i'm not trying to uh, promote or back the side of the trainers who don't work out. I think that's bullshit too. Um, you should experience this says a lot, but again, I see this so common and so often that people try to use the whole, the way they look. And you have to remember what in, in what innately goes into this point too. And this is a big point, which is a topic for a whole other video is steroids. Um, steroids goes into this steroids. helps a lot of people do things you take the average lifter let's just say you take a, a person a regular person let's just say they got bad genetics they're not very strong they never were strong they don't gain muscle good and let's just say they worked from a 135 deadlift or 100 pound deadlift to a 405 or 425 deadlift let's just say they worked and they have let, remember we're assuming that this person has bad genetics they're just not made they got bad lever leverage bad biomechanics um they just don't have good muscle fiber composition. They're just not, they, they, their technique's good, but they're just, they've really hard. They have to work against their genetics to get to this 425 deadlift max. Now, let's just say someone who's a regular person has good genetics. And let's just say that naturally, if they would have stayed naturally, that they can, they would have got to like a 5, 80 deadlift and then let's just say on top of this they're taking gear and then now they're doing like a 7 720 deadlift or 780 deadlift because they power lift or whatever now just because of these two things does not mean that the person who lifts more knows better they have a lot of cards on their sides gear good good genetics um maybe good anatomy maybe things that lift just comes easy for them so you're telling me that the, and let's just say the first person to the weaker person they have a a degree in exercise science and kinesiology and they've trained 10 people and let's just say no one knew that and that person commented on youtube and said that well this guy's wrong about this and then everyone floods them because the guy's mentioning deadlifting 720 in the video and that guy takes gear and he has good genetics it doesn't mean shit that's not that's taking one thing at face value and saying that oh he's right because of this which is bullshit again you know you know, actually think about the scenario, use some logic, analyze the situation and say, well, okay, well, is he right? Is he wrong? And it's not bad to say, I don't know. I don't know if you're right or wrong. Then in that case, just don't comment, you know, but don't just believe someone because they're strong or big or what they look like. What they look like is, and I'll sum it up with this. The fitness industry is the only industry where people will think that you know what you're talking about based off of what you look. And that does have a little bit of credibility because how you look or what you can do is based off of lit working out, but that's not should be the predominant factor on whether or not someone is right or whether or not you listen to them. It should be what they know and is it logical? Does it make sense? Does it um, coincide with the literature? Those things should account more than how you look. All right, the sixth and second to last point uh, myth that uh, we need to talk about is you must eat immediately post workout. Um, you must get protein immediately post workout. Now, this isn't necessary. This isn't true. Um, I know again in a lot of in again I'm certified by the National Council on Strength and Fitness. I think they're a good certification, but I've read this in multiple books, and it just seems to me like they do the studies, but and they do make good conclusions on what they're looking for in these personal trainer books but it's not directly coinciding with what they're trying to say. For example, 
They're saying that you need to eat immediately post-workout because cells are most permeable at this time. They uptake nutrients better at this time. Well, okay, that might be the case. Let's just say that's true, okay, that cells are more permeable post-workout and then they do uptake nutrients better. But does this lead to increased hypertrophy and does this in lead to increased strength gains? That is the question. And when you look at the literature and you see when protein and when nutrients are equated, which means they're equal between two different people, you can't say that one takes more than the other because that's going to mess the whole study up. But this study showed that when they took two groups, one group who ate immediately post workout and one group who didn't, then the group that, remember, nutrients are equated, so they ate, they ate the same amount of daily protein as each other. Um, that the group who didn't eat, who waited, I think it was two hours post workout versus immediately. Remember, two hours post workout is past the anabolic window. The anabolic window is about 30 minutes to an hour. So that's past the anabolic window. They seen no difference in gains in strength, hypertrophy, nothing. So basically, you don't need to worry about eating immediately post workout as long as you're getting enough protein throughout the day. Now, I wouldn't take that to drastic measures. I wouldn't say that, like, oh, if you wait, oh, and again, I might be wrong on this too. I'm just making, uh, I'm trying to logically think about this because I don't think there's been a study that showed this. I wouldn't wait like, like for example, do your workout, then stay up an abnormally long time. Let's just say because you're jacked up off caffeine or something and wait till 16 hours later or something and then eat protein. I don't know what a study would show about that. Um, that might show uh, that there would be some decrease in gains in strength because at some point you got to think um, protein synthesis is approximately uh, 36 to 48 hours after you work out max. After that, you're you're not building off of the previous workout that you did. So, I mean, 16 hours is a big gap. But again, immediately post-workout, if you're eating within a relatively few hours post-workout, you're fine. Now, I'm not saying that eating immediately post-workout is bad, but I'm just saying it doesn't inherently give you some type of magical properties or or that like cellular permeability is is something that's going to lead to increase in strength things or hypertrophy and again it's hard i put this on this list because i hear it a lot but it's not this isn't kind of it's almost not even bro science because again this was in my personal trainer textbook this was in multiple personal trainer textbooks that i've seen but it's just it's a uh, it's not true. So um, that's not that big of a deal. It's, uh, it's not a big deal if you don't eat, if you wait a few hours to eat, as long as you're getting the proper amount of protein, carbs, and fats throughout the day. All right, the last and final a myth or myth that we're going to talk about, um, number seven, bro science, whatever, again, whatever you want to call it, is that full depth is harder than partial range of motion. And we talked about this earlier. Um, and this kind of relates to the full range of motion doesn't count. Um, but again, this is this is definitely different. Um, a lot of people like to say that full range of motion is harder than uh, is harder than partial range of motion, which is not necessarily true um, in different instances. And the major instance that I'm going to talk about, um, which applies mostly to this, is that if you were to take a, your near max bench press and you bench press and then you stopped a half an inch above your chest. And then you went back up to complete the breath. Now, let's just say you wait a couple of days and you take that exact same weight and then you come down and you touch your chest and then you immediately go back up and then you rack the weight. It's going 99% of the time, if you did it correctly, it is going to be easier the second time when you touch your chest. Why? This is mainly due to the stretch shortening cycle or, or mainly the tendons, but our tendons and ligaments have elastic properties to them like elastic kind of like a rubber band like a like a rebound effect in them when you immediately go from an eccentric contraction to a concentric contraction this is called the amortization phase um it's the small gap between you, you, when you change over from your eccentric and concentric contractions that's the amortization phase so when you keep that amortization phase as little as possible um, you increase this elastic rebound effect from your tendons ligaments muscle tissue and it helps helps you lift more weight versus just your muscles contracting alone it's kind of like a rubber band um when you go down in the in the rep real quick real quick and then you bounce kind of back up then it's going to help you lift more weight now i'm not saying bounce the weight off your chest it's not what i'm saying you could do this in any scenario you could do this with a curl you could do this with a bench press you could do this with a squat um this is if this wasn't true then pause pause reps would not be any harder than non-pause reps Take your max, uh, take your max workload of any or your max lift of any exercise. Or I probably wouldn't do it with max. Maybe your sub max squat, sub max bench press. Take it, 
do a, a do a rep and again you can do this with a different one you could use the example i said earlier but here's a different example go down touch your chest and once you touch your chest immediately once you touch your chest go back up with a squat do the same thing you can squat to whatever depth you normally do and once you get to the bottom of the depth immediately go back into your concentric portion of the lift to go back up then the, on different days do the same thing except this time and when you get to the bottom of the rep just pause pause at the bottom of your chest clear all movement stop all movement and then go back up same thing with the squat go to a squat pause at the bottom it doesn't have to be a long pause i'm not we're not trying to task your cardiovascular system we're not trying to use that as, i don't want you to use that as, as an excuse as oh it's it messes up with my cardio because i'm down in the hole for too long well just pause for half a second or a second kill all momentum and then stop right there and it's not really momentum because the, if anything on a squat, the momentum is take. I'm just using that because it's more of a general term, but the momentum is taking you down in a squat. What it is, it's the stretch shortening cycle. Again, your muscles, ligaments, and tissues, you can look it up yourself. Um, if you don't understand what that is, they have an elastic, like kind of rebound property to them, like a rubber band, because that's basically kind of like what your muscles are um, that help you lift more weight. So it's not necessarily easier to, or it's not easier to do partial range of motion and it's not harder to do full full range of motion technically i would say the hardest way to do a set would be to stop like a, a quarter inch above where you have your stretch shortening cycle that would be the hardest because basically what you're doing then is you're going to have to completely uh counteract the force that you've created from the eccentric portion of the lift all through muscle activation alone with no tendons and no ligaments basically you're completely taking out the stretch shortening cycle it'd be the same thing with a pause rep so if you just pause long enough that you kill all uh you kill all the effect from the stretch shortening cycle it's going to be extremely hard and what happens when you do this is that the energy that's stored in your elastic tissues from your ligaments and tendons uh, it gets lost as heat so that's why it's good when you're doing like counter movement jumps or like vertical jumps to do this eccentric do the littlest amortization phase as possible. So go to your eccentric, do your eccentric, then as quick as you can explode into your concentric. If you go down and then wait three seconds and then go up, you're not going to have as impact or high, as high of a jump. But there you guys, there you guys have it. That clears all seven of these myths, bro science facts, things that you should not believe and why they, why you don't believe them. Uh, thank you for sticking to the end of this episode. Again, please check out my Patreon page. It's patreon.com forward slash JP fitness. That's patreon.com forward slash JP fitness. I have all my social media linked on there. The best place to reach me is my Facebook page. You guys can message me on there. I mean, if you have any questions about my Patreon page, you can message me there. You can leave a comment on my YouTube videos, but Facebook is a better place to uh reach me again my patreon is for people that want to help uh support me become a patron is what they call it you can become a patron and then uh depending on how much you want to pledge you're going to be able to get some good rewards in turn in return and i'll definitely make sure it's worth it so again check me out on there but until next time see ya